Good evening and welcome to Hot Topics from the Soul. I'm your host, Dr. Valerie Parker Hagen. And I'm Dr. J.R. Cooper. So glad to be with you on this evening. I am so excited about tonight. We're going to continue from last week, but a little bit about me. I'm an author, best-selling author, my first book, From the Soul of a Woman Love Shouldn't Hurt. Also, from um, uh, Limited Possibilities, Walking in Purpose. Those are my two bestsellers. However, I wrote four books and you can find it on www.fromthesoulofawoman.com. Dr. J? And Dr. J.R. Thicklin here. I am a practitioner, domestic violence, and dealing with the area also of fatherlessness, the impact of fatherlessness. And we continue to do work inside of writing uh, curriculums dealing with the faith community and domestic violence. And even better so, we're talking about now uh, the transition on the other side of COVID-19. So I'm looking so glad. You can always find me www.destinybychoice.org or jrthicklin.com. Yes. As I said last week, we had Adrian and Carter with us and he wrote the book, Let's get married and do everything except make it last. And I begin to think about that because, you know, as a woman, when we're growing up, all we fantasize about is getting married. Most of us, we, we fantasize of getting married because we watch television and we see uh, what romance is supposed to look like. So our expectations are high as it relates to romance because we figure that's the way it's supposed to be because that's how television dictates that it's supposed to be. So we look for that. We spend our whole entire life searching for what we see on television and it's not always a reality. Well, you're exactly right. Uh, I think young girls are socialized so different from boys. You know, I grew up with six sisters, five of them being older than I am. And I still remember everything from them playing with dolls and baby dolls to them being obsessed with books like Harlequin Romance and all those things that kind of prepared them for this fairy tale that one day I'll get married. And I, and I like to say that, you know, when I think about that, it's interesting because as a boy growing up, we never thought about the fact of growing up being somebody's husband. We just was too busy playing cops and robbers, wrestling and those type things there. And if anything, you thought about what you wanted to be, very different than girls. And oftentimes I think the lack of preparation in the mind of the young men at an early age oftentimes makes it a little difficult to really commit. Well, let's talk about commitment. Uh, so, Dr. J, you said that growing up, you never thought about getting married or uh, falling in love. You were busy doing your boy thing. You never thought about that. Well, you never had a childhood crush. Yeah, I mean, I mean, let me let me be very clear on that. Uh, uh, definitely, there was a childhood crush that I crushed on, and thing, and, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I did, and. Uh, and, and the crazy thing about it was, yes, you, you those are butterfly feelings and, you know, you feel that way to a certain degree. But it was never with this ultimate goal that I'm going to get married and all those things. It was it was the moment. So you felt the moment more or less inside of that. And, you know, I always wanted to know what it would be like, you know, you know, to hold hands, you know, you're on your way to the basketball game or the football game. And you look like this couple, but really never got beyond that page. You know, growing Do up, you there. think that in the Christian dome, that too much pressure and emphasis is bought or communicated about getting marriage that puts a pressure on individuals um, in the church, it's especially females, because it's it's like what, a hundred women to one man, basically, <laughs> if you go to a mega church. And it's like, if one brother comes in there and he's single, it's like he scoped <laughs> out, everybody got dibs on him. So do you think there's a lot of pressure on in the kingdom for women to get married? I do think it is. And I think that pressure is there, but I think the kingdom in this way kind of reflects the world. I mean, this whole thing about, marriage, you know, love and marriage, you know, as easy as a horse and carriage and all that type thing. But I think in the church, 
the pressure comes from a different place. I think it's almost as it's the safeguard, you know, get married or you're going to fall into the, the abyss of sin, get married. So I wonder, do people really get married because of true love, romance, and really can envision this future building together? Or do they get married because of fact uh, they're more fearful of, uh, of falling to this abyss of sin and then being marked with the scarlet letter that you are what you are at that time. <laughs> yeah, but then here we were in the church and we have anticipations of falling in love. We're watching television and then we're seeing what the Bible says about love and marriage and, and relationships and how it's supposed to be. We have women walking around talking about, that's my Boaz, I'm looking for my Boaz. And then when someone comes because he doesn't fit the exterior of what we feel that that Boaz should look like, then there's a problem. Well, you know, our, our host, I mean, I guess Adrian Carter, he's waiting to get in and maybe we're going to hear from his perspective of uh, how that works. So I see that he's there. He's just ready to be let in on the call at this time. And, uh, you know, uh, that's something to really consider there. You know, do we get it wrong because of the structure, the foundation that has been given to us? You know, you got to get married. And when you don't see a good example of marriage, you know, you wonder, why are you making me drink this? Why are you going to make me drink this deadly poison? Why are you going to make me drink this? Because some people that, you know, I saw in the church as a young man, I'll be honest with you, if that was love, I, I, I really didn't want to see hate. They, they look bitter. They look very unnatural. They look at I me. Mean, I was trying to, find, you know, do y'all really love each other, or, you know, or just some type of arrangement going on here? So uh, <laughs> with, that, with that being said, we welcome Adrian Ed Carter, my dear friend, in the day. We're just kind of talking about this whole notion of how we're socialized different. Girls grow up with this whole fantasy. One day I'm going to get married, and they, they prepare for that. And I had some yeah. boy growing up. That wasn't my end game. That wasn't my end goal. You know, uh, I lived in the moment, if that be a thing. Now, I haven't said that. I was somewhat shy because I did not like rejection. So guess what? We would be friends all day forever. <laughs> Unless like you show me either. that you were really <laughs> So feel free to try. Well, Adrian, I, I started by. Other than that, listen, I may be getting my therapy session. <laughs> I, listen, I don't like rejection either. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> like you. I'm, I want to friend zone it out first and see how, uh, where it goes. Exactly. So I, I, I totally understand that. <laughs> how you doing? Good evening, Dr. Valerie. I am so well. I'm glad you joined us because I open up by talking about your book and thank you so much for sending me something. I had a chance to get, uh, a better glimpse of who you are because I was speaking to you blindly last week. So um, I appreciate you sending that to me. And I learned more from reading your book about your heart. And I wanted to talk about that because one of the things that I talked about with to Dr. J is that we grow up with these expectations of what romance and what love looks like. And when it gets to be real life and realize that it's not like what it is on television or what we see probably our grandparents experiences or what the Bible says it should look like, then we fall out and we get all um, kind of butt wild emotionally because it's not planned out like how we envision it to be. So we want to we want to check out of the relationship and then say, oh, we married the wrong one because it's not looking like the way it should look. Not right. realizing right. that any relationship costs work. You have to pay a right. price right. to be who you are individually and then collectively. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. You know, the um, I think part of the challenge is if if church if church was a store that you can go and buy something from, it sells marriage, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's very difficult to be in church and not be enthralled with the message of marriage. And keep in, keep in mind, the, the one of the greatest metaphors that comes out of the Bible is understanding the church as the bride 
mm -hmm. as the bride and, and Christ as that bridegroom, that there is a marriage, right? That that exists. So I think we 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 somehow fall into that expected pattern because the manifestation of Christ in the church and the Godhead is in marriage. So when you know one and two come together, they now have this oneness that represents the power of God. So I, I think it's so I think it's very um, inevitable in a lot of ways that we move to a space of viewing marriage as the as the end game. But I think what hap what has happened is I'm more critical of the church in its approach than I am of the institution of marriage in it in and of itself. Now I say that as a as a co-pastor within my church, I say that as a PK. Uh, I've been a PK a long time. Um, a preacher's kid, and and um, and I say that also with my father, who's been married for uh, with my stepmother, who I call mom just as well, uh, for what thirty five years, thirty six years. They've been they've been they they're nearing a forty year mark at some level. Mm -hmm. But I think what happens is in the church is. I think the church wrestles with sexuality mm. when, in a big way. Yes. Right? I think church doesn't know how, in general, denominationally, it doesn't know how to balance the conversation of speaking about sex and sexuality and mm -hmm. spirituality. Right. It shuns, in a lot of ways, it shuns sexuality, it upholds spirituality, and reality is it's confusing. It's very confusing because then you come back to a relationship which is sexual, it is emotional it, as well as it is spiritual. And I don't think we're having a holistic enough conversation in churches to show people how to have a balanced relationship. So you go into this very spiritually um, defined thing that has a lot of emotional and natural components to it and sexual components and, and people are none the wiser for it. And they don't, they don't know how to deal with it because the church has not robustly or more holistically had that conversation with this, with this congregation. One of the things you talked about in your book was um, going through that marriage breakup and how your heart was broken. And I think from the female side, we don't feel that men feel anything when they're going through right. because we're so broken and so wounded in our emotions to we're like, oh, he just going on to the next one. Because I know when I was going through my marriage, I was really struggling here. I had the children, four of them, and they were all under nine. And I, I, I and I was struggling by myself. And my ex at that time, he was going on and started dating, living his life. And I had all the baggage. And I was like, doesn't he know that this is hard? Doesn't he know that he broke my heart? Doesn't he know that he's breaking the children's heart? He was just going on happy go lucky. But there are men that can walk away like that and don't feel a thing. Absolutely. But in your there book, are. you expressed the heartache and pain you felt. And oftentimes we as females don't feel that y'all feel anything. Yeah. No, what does I, that look I, I, like? How did that look like? It's found on that for the listeners. It, it, um, well, you know, it was hurtful. Uh, it, it was a place where you, I, as a man, and I think like, like, like many other men. So let me back up. I understand that there are multiple categories of people, right? The well intentioned and the ill intention. I think who gets overlooked are well intentioned men, right? To some extent. Men who go into a relationship or go into the marriage, especially, you know, wanting to be a good husband, wanting to be stand up and and do what they're supposed to do and be a provider, be a protector and 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 hold down the forward and do all those things that are that are that's said to be to come with that space. I think what happens is um, just like how women run into failed expectations, men run into failed expectations. Absolutely. And I talk about that in, in chapter 14 of my book that, you know, leadership from men have failed women over the centuries. But there's but men have also been failed in this idea of 
especially when we go back to church, this idea of what a submitted wife is supposed to look like. You know, you, you didn't, you know, I, you, you go in, you didn't expect it to be a war. You, you thought that you had a level of authority and dominion over this place and you were the king and you're the head and all this talk about leadership only to realize that you're not really the leader, right? It's, 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 it's spoken of theoretically, but in actuality, and this is why I do the work that I do when it comes to leadership development, I don't even I don't even believe that the man is truly even the head of the household. I think we say it theoretically because it's scriptural. But I think what happens in practice is you're still dealing with another competent individual with their own set of ideas and goals and 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 where they want to be in life and how they think something should be done. And one of the biggest, biggest trappings of this relationship dynamics is if the woman is the one who has the who has to determine if the man is actually a good leader and a good head of the household then really she has the power because she's the one who gets to assess him as a man and if she has deemed him that he's not a good enough man or he's an immature man then all of a sudden he loses stock or value as a man absolutely so you so so what men find out in the long run is that this woman is not just, it's not just a submission thing. She's not, you know, I to Christ and she to me. You begin to realize that the power dynamics within the relationship is that she's on equal footing with you. Because if she does not approve of something, she has just as much weight in the process to push back and, and chaos can come out of it. So how does a man then learn to manage and lead within that situation and how does a woman learn to manage and lead within that situation that's again part of the 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 training that i don't think comes you know as holistically as it should so when you do have a man who is attempting to do the best he can based on what he knows and then you see that that whole social contract is falling underneath you and it's not working out the way that you thought it would doing what you thought to be best it becomes very heartbreaking um, I was someone who was interested in growing old, you know, and sitting on the porch and, Hey baby, you remember the time? And, and yeah, I remember the time, you know, we have those remember the time conversations. So when, when it doesn't pan out that way and you have children, you have a family and you were looking to be able to provide that stability for your children, it is very heartbreaking. Um, and, uh, and it looks how you see it always looks, you know, people be crying and snotting and, and, uh, and they feel in some kind of way, but you know, as a man, you know, you don't go out there and let them out see that, you know, you kind of wash your face or cry outside when it's raining. So everything kind of blends together, but it's, it's the same emotions that women go through are the exact same emotions that men go through. I think we're just told to women can be more expressive and communicated, com communicative about it while men may tend to be more hidden in our hurt because ultimately, and I'll, I'll conclude with this last one. Ultimately, the way that our society is set up, men are not allowed to be victims. Even after they've been victimized, they have to find a way to overcome that victimization and move on as if they're not as if they're not a victim. Because part of the definition within masculinity is that you're not allowed to play victim at all. Well, it is. It has been said many times that women react in a marriage or any relationship based on the fact that if a father presence was there. And that's not always true because you have women that were raised by strong women that don't have men phobias that dictate. And then also there are men that were raised without fathers. What do you say about that? Because they have weaknesses because that parent, that headship wasn't in there. So it works hand in hand on both sides. It's not just because, oh, the woman didn't have a father, a man in the house to treat, so she can know how to treat a man because that's normally what the man says about the woman when a marriage or relationship is failing. It's like she didn't get no home training. She, she, uh, <laughs> she, <laughs> she let the women tell her what to do and she gonna be alone. So, <laughs> so well, it goes you know both too with the man too because they haven't been taught how to love. They haven't been taught how to be a father. They haven't been, been taught how to care for a woman. I like men to still open my door and try to make sure I'm okay. If I'm coming in late, I want to make sure there's someone that's going to walk me to my door and don't just drop me off and drive off 
as I close the car door. So I, I still like all that, but a lot of men aren't doing that even in the church. Well, I, I think that's, with everything you said, that's pending that if they have a present mother or father, that that mother or father is being a good example, right? So that's another, that's another caveat is a, a present father or present parent doesn't make them a good parent, right? Doesn't mean that they're modeling good behavior. I mean, you could have a father that's present and it could be just as much conflict and drama and, 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 and miscommunication and ineffectiveness within the relationship. I, I think really what ends up happening, um, Dr. Valerie, is that there are thousands of scenarios that, or hundreds of scenarios that play itself out, different variables. There is, I, I think, the, the 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 quicker ones to point to is we can talk about absentee parents but ultimately i think what happens is i encourage people at some point they have to grow up if you will at some point they have to move past the excuses of who was not present and begin to take take uh, responsibility and accountability for their life Especially yeah, but it's if you hard wanted... if they don't have someone to speak into their life, rather it be a parent, but a friend, I, a true friend right. is somebody that tells you the truth about who you are. And those are few and far between. So unless well, somebody well, tells but, you, but, show you. But unless that person is living on an island, listen, people have jobs and they have performance reviews. That, that performance review told you about your attitude. You, you know it's bad. Um, you, you, oh, no, you it's the boss's a, fault though. They just didn't, yeah, you know, want right, to right. know, no but, but then the person, but, but then you're going to have an, if you're going to have an individual that is just always trying to, um, sidestep accountability and responsibility for their actions, then, then they're going to continue to be met with the results of that. But I definitely encourage people to, even though, and I'm not saying that it's not work required. Because again, the, the, the situation for me is not an absent parent. The situation is the culture of the relationship or the culture of the dynamics of your family, right? Because you can have no father or no mother and still turn out a particular way. You have, you can have, you can have a present father. You can have both. You can have both and still be, and, and turn out and, and be horrible in relationships and toxic and manipulative and all of those things. So that doesn't, so at some point, I believe the presence of certain people in our life plays role up to a point, but the bulk of that responsibility falls on the individual. Because any if anything else outside of that, it just becomes an excuse. Well, I'm a butthole in relationships because my father wasn't there. Well, then who's supposed to take that, you know, on as as an adequate response? No, you need to go work on yourself and stop being that type of a person. Your father not being there or your mother or your mother not being there or anybody for that sake not being there is not an adequate excuse after a while. That excuse runs out after a while. Well, I think it's so critical and we see this happening so often in life and we paint this broad brush when, even when we see people get in trouble, when we see people miss the mark and we, the first place we start with, did you grow up in a two parent home or not? Like that is some type of magic cure. And I'm not minimizing right. it at all because you can go back to what you said, the condition, the culture of that home, you know, good or bad can affect you. So I often say when I'm dealing with uh, audiences, particularly men, uh, incarcerated and other men, I talk about the fact the only reason to look back is not for the excuse, but perhaps find an explanation of maybe things I omitted or things that I allowed to infiltrate me or things that I focus on. You know, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, I often talk about I grew up with six sisters and, you know, you think that I had no brothers at all because I talk about the influence of those six sisters in my life. Five of them was older than I am. But the reality is I had three brothers, one which was my oldest brother and my two younger brothers. Well, I don't talk about them a lot the younger because the fact they did not influence me even my oldest brother god rest his soul did not have that type of influence on me however i found my influence partly through my dad and he was there the whole time there are certain things i i grabbed from and i traded from him but there were other people that i also grabbed some great nuggets from and those were men that were in my life like my like my junior high school principal the late dr frederick douglas reese and uh, uh, and, and so many that I looked at 
And I modeled things in them, or at least tried to, that I did not even see at home. Now I have a right. choice. Any of us have a choice. If we set out and we begin to, if you would, amplify our inadequacies and our inabilities, and we amplify our failures based upon the fact we did not have a father in the home, what we're doing is succumbing to our own narrative. And we're saying, here's my reason, here's my passport in life. The reason you need to be understanding of me, the reason you need to be forgiving of me is because I didn't have a father. And we can't play that card. Because in that case, we're automatically going to perpetuate that type of thinking in the next generation. Somewhere along the line, we do have to understand, listen here, my culture, what I came up with would not be my, my excuse. What is it that I need to be? How can I get there? Somewhere along the line, we have to turn the page because other than that, we're going to be stuck looking in the review mirror. What do, what do you say about uh, <coughs> relationships where you're bringing blended families like, with smaller children into a relationship? Hi. Dr. J, I, I know you can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't have, that's not my forte yet. I'm still grown in that area. Dr. Dr. Thicklin. Okay. Well, yeah, I tell yeah you, you, you could talk about that fluently, yeah. Dr. Ray. Yeah. Well, one of the things I, I, I think here, when you talk about blended families, is number one, understanding your role. Understanding your role. And that's something that needs to be discussed before you ever come together like this. Because it's not just a matter of we love each other and we want to be together. Man, you bring together, you bring together other people inside of it. And children are territorial. They're very territorial. Think about it. I'm bringing together two families. My daughter is used to having her own room, but your daughter is used to having her own room. And now we're talking about you guys are going to have to share room. You're about to have World War II go up in there. So mm -hmm. you have to have this type of discussion ahead of time, number one. Number two, you have to understand both of you must assess the ages of the children and what role that you may have to play. And they may not be the very same role. What do I mean? What is the level of involvement of the other parent, meaning the biological parent? What is the level of that involvement? Because if the level of involvement of the other biological parent is good involvement, is healthy involvement, you might not have to be the person who tried to be the disciplinarian. Your role may be a supportive role, an enforcer role to help enforce things inside of that. You have to have those discussions. By the same token, if you're dealing with someone who has an absent biological parent, and depending on the age, you may have to adjust that role there. Where can I find? Where is my niche? Say he's 11 years old. Say he's 12. And all of a sudden, I'm dealing with a 12-year-old boy who might not be very happy about the fact that mom has moved on and married this guy here who I don't know, and I'm going to still be checking him out. And then in addition to that, he's got two other sons like, man, I can take him any day of the week. You know, that's the only thing. You know, I can I can take him any day of the week. My role in there, I have to I have to assess where's my strength. Mm -hmm. What is it that I can give him? What part of me that I could give him that might complement what he doesn't have to bring him up? And if I go that role and not just go head in trying to be the disciplinarian, I then can build relationships. But if I go in, I'm like, well, look, at this is my house, and this way it ain't going to be. And, you know, and I'm telling the wife, look, I'm telling you right now, he ain't going to cut me like that. He ain't wearing that in rain around here because I don't go. <laughs> that's not relationship yeah. building. Rude. Well, you know, that's key right there. Right. That's key right there. It's, it's all about relationship yeah. building. Right. Because rules without relationship equals rebellion. So if I give rules and I don't accept a relationship, I'm guaranteed that's going to be rebellion. And the rebellion is going to happen from the kid. And if you press too much, you're going to get rebellion from your spouse. And that's going to happen. So blended family is you building that relationship, modeling that relationship, reaching out. And the kids will eventually gravitate if you do it well. But if you're going to come there and you're going to really come there with a very aggressive type attitude and, and you try to lay down the law. And we do that because we've been told that's what men do. You go in and you establish the law. Man, you don't establish no law without establishing a relationship. Mm. And that's so from a man's perspective, what are expectations when you're uh, looking for a bride? You know, that's funny you asked that. Somebody else just posted that question on 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 Facebook today really? and I responded to it. Yeah. You know, oh, um, OK, <laughs> um, I'm trying to have woman power here. 
<laughs> one of my one of my learning gains um, is that is understanding that my the quintessential role that I, that I would be looking for, and I think people should really consider in looking for a spouse is someone who is going to pray for you and keep you spiritually lifted up. Um, I, the reason why I think that's very, that's vital is because we need to establish a we conversation. I think from jump, we, we have, we, we discuss relationships in a very conflicting way. We start off with the, well, a man is supposed to, and a woman is supposed to. And I think that's already the start of conflict. I think we need to be in a, we are supposed to situation. We're supposed to provide and protect for each other. E even though we don't tend to use the term provision and protection with a woman as synonymous with a woman. But I think that's problematic actually, that we don't, because she's just as responsible for providing and protecting. Part of that provision and part of that protection, I think, um, is is prayer and serving as a covering for one another, and and being and being able to find a way to uplift and to support the next person. And I and for me, I think that a lot of that begins with with prayer and words of encouragement and affirmation for a spouse. So I so someone has to be um, mature enough in their own personal resolve, you know, as a as a woman. For, for me personally to begin to consider her in that space. Because I, I think everything else in life is pretty much straightforward. We have work, we have kids, you know, we have projects, we have uh, our goals and our ambitions and things that we're working on. You need somebody to be able to push you through that by establishing, by having a mission and a vision within the relationship and then the prayer to be able to support that. I think the other things we 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 kind of know, you know, it you're gonna take it's gonna take effective communication. You're gonna have to work through those type of um, situations as they come up. But I think the undergirding of all of that is, do you have someone that's gonna pray and cover and lift you up through the process? Amen. Amen. I, I think... Expectations. That's a good expectation. When I met my husband, he asked me what I was looking for, and I said I wanted somebody to take care of me. And I wanted somebody to be able to pray for me when I couldn't pray for myself. And he says, well, I can help you take care of you. <laughs> and he says, I can pray for you. And those were the two things I, that was important to me was because I already had everything I needed. I've traveled the world. I've met hundreds of people. Um, I had been in relationships and it had been 19 years since my divorce. So I, my perspective on life and needs were different. So when you're younger and don't have children, of course, expectations are different. But when you're a woman of a certain age who's found a purpose and living that life and just want somebody to, to complement who you already are, it's a whole lot easier work. It's still work, but it's easier work than trying to build a foundation when you're younger. Right. Yeah. I, I think all of that is so true. And, you know, I listen when you say that so many times, I think we have to be careful and, and we have to be sure about what we want, what we really desire and not find ourselves desiring what we think people want. People want, or yes. Or desiring what the we think the church want, or this fit the right optics for me. This this is right optics. We we look good together because at the end of the day, yes, they're praying for you. Yes, that person there to support you. But it's also the fact that person who who understands the fact that Superman is not always wearing his cape. Right. That person who can love and embrace you as Clark Kent. That person who recognizes the fact that your imperfections or weaknesses, is, your imperfections are not seen as these great weaknesses. 
that your imperfection is, is it's a sign that you still are being worked on and developing, that I do need your prayers because if you hold me to the standard that I'm not going to even burp out of order, I'm not going to even, uh, you know, that, that somehow or another I'm defined as a failure because I didn't always perfect what you thought can also be very toxic. It can be. Right. And I think it's important because real love, real love, not only cover a multitude of fault, but real love knows also how to cover. And I think that's important. I think men need covering more. We often talk about men being the covering for the woman, and that is right, uh, biblically. But a man also needs a woman to be able to cover him inside of his own frailties, inside of things. Because if we don't allow this, this is what I think. We really we really get it twisted. Because I do believe that 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 men and women define this sense of uh, men and want women define this sense of uh, faithfulness differently. I think we do. I think we we define different things differently. For for a man, it's very important to me. I know, and, and most men I really know that are that are men that assure themselves. It's important to me that I can be vulnerable, and I can be transparent with her. If I can't be vulnerable and transparent with her without her weaponizing my vulnerability against me, then we're going to have a real problem. Because what that says is that you only adore me, esteem me, and love me in my strength. Mm. I don't need you just to love me, esteem me, and adore me in my strength. I need to know that you got my back. I need to know that you love me even in my in my down chart or my down season. And I think that's crucial inside of all things because you can be looking cute when I'm up or down. You're still cute and I'm suffering, I'm down. And, but if you weaponize my vulnerability and my transparencies against me, that means I can't share with you. Now you want me to put on a facade. I can't share with you what I'm really feeling where I just simply need your embracing of uh, even your encouragement at that point. And so I think we have to be very careful that with what we're looking for, that, that we don't end up getting a bunch of appetizers. <laughs> and no, someone I, who I, doesn't appreciate it. No, I, I totally agree with that, Dr. Um, Thicklin. Th that ability to be vulnerable and this idea of men not being allowed to be victims, like what I talked about before, right? So right. sometimes that looks like vulnerability. Right. It, it's there's this idea that as a man, you're supposed to have the answers. You have to know what you're doing, where you're going. You need to get it figured out. Um, mm -hmm. Anything short of that questioning, um, um, seeming to be compromising the situation, um, uncertainty. All of a sudden, this idea becomes, well, you're not a, you're, you're you, you lose the image of being a man. And one right. of the things I write about in the book is that. I think, unfortunately, a lot of times women are women are really looking for fathers, not husbands. Wow. And 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 what I mean by that is they're looking for someone to replace the the certainty and the image of masculinity that they saw in their father. But what I write is that you have to understand the problem with that is when you experience your father, when a, when a girl is experiencing her father, the power dynamics of father to child is not the same as husband to wife. The power dynamics of, of, of father and child is one where in most instances, we're going to see our parents as, as all knowing and knowing best and leading us. And so it, it, it doesn't have the same experience. In fact, the child does not experience the father as her mother experiences her father. The mother could be the one having the father's back and the, the, the daughter could think her father's the greatest man in the world. Which, exactly. which, which, which is great, which is great in that instance. But then what happens is she grows up now looking for that same greatness. And, and well, what, that happens also with the men. They're looking for mothers, not wives. Oh, they absolutely are. They absolutely are. What, what ends up happening in, in the long run is um, they they're they're missing in either way. They're missing the growing together aspect of it and wanting yeah. the already made and i think so when a man appears to be in their making process right it doesn't always look masculine and i think sometimes women 
exploit that or they weaponize that or they undermine that because again as a man you're not looking like a man so i so i think you know what uh, dr thickland said about that vulnerability and seeing allowing me to grow and adapt and change my mind and 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 rethink and reshape and make mistakes somebody has to be able to work with you through that as i also work with her it's it's a mutual there's nothing on my end that's more response that's greater for me than it is for her it's really a mutual um a mutual situation i think the breakdown on both sides comes when an individual doesn't even like themselves they don't like their circumstances or uh, what's going on in their lives and they look to another in individuals to validate who they are instead of them owning their space and commanding that space and standing on their truth and valuing who they are as a person instead of wanting somebody to validate who they are and be willing to embrace a life outside of me myself and i where mm -hmm. all the focus all the spotlight is on me and wanting to expand the possibilities of having somebody in my space and thinking i'm worthy of somebody to be in my space and vice versa so that we can have love be reciprocated and be open and that, that's why i keep saying being open to the possibilities of something greater than what we already see well, it, it, it's so interesting because I do believe that to a certain degree, we look at love and marriage almost as a concluded deal. I'm not sure if we always allow this space to develop and to evolve and to grow. And so when we hit a bump or whatever, boom, I don't know how to necessarily make adjustments because I've already concluded the end result. And I think it's so important to take to take this, to get rid of this cookie cutter approach when it comes to this thing that we call marriage or this thing that we call when we're building a relationship. Okay, so you saying that most most times when you're like say, just casually taking someone out on a date that they aut aut automatically have taken you down the aisle? Well, it depends I'm on where they are in life. I've seen that happen a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The dress is in the closet, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> because it, it happens. Yeah. Yes. It definitely, you know, uh, because their expectations going back to our, the first part of our conversation. But do you well, know, do you know when a woman is vulnerable in that space? I mean, you as a man, do you already know that they're vulnerable? And where do you draw the line in capitalizing off of their vulnerability? Well, I'll be honest with you, it scares me. It, 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 it scares me it, if it's too desperate, if it's too ready to do this too quickly, it's a scary part because it's almost like I've already written a narrative and this is what we're gonna do. And we're gonna go here, we're gonna experience that. We're gonna hold up, excuse me. I don't even know your middle name. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know nothing about. And so I think that, you know, the, the, the fact that we think that we can skip over so many important things is dangerous. When you talk about if you recognize this inside of her, I think that's where the whole part of getting to know someone else. Because oftentimes, and, and we know this, that you know, women look at the biological clock. And oftentimes they look at, well, you know, boy, I'm 45, you know, I ain't married. I'm, I'm 49, I'm not married. I'm 50 and I'm not married. And then you start wondering what's driving their decision. Is it their age and not being married? Or is it them having a clear perspective of marriage and willing to engage in that journey of doing so. Or do well, that's scary too when they're of a certain age because they, especially when you get over 50, you're so set in your ways mm -hmm. about how you want to live your life. It becomes kind of selfish to allow somebody else into that closet. Cause I know when, with my husband, he was like, uh, I don't think my clothes going to fit in here, <laughs> but because I was open to inviting him into my, not just my life, but my heart, I was mentally prepared to share who I was and what I had into my living space. So a lot of people are not willing to do that, to share. It's like you on a, a playground and you're fighting over a certain toy or a certain boy and the best man wins is it becomes like that 
well, I wasn't, I was in a different mindset where I was open to the possibility of saying, okay, I want this person in my space, whatever I have is his, instead of functioning from a place of selfishness. And I think that that cripples a relationship when you're selfish, where it's me, myself, and I. Well, absolutely. And that, you know, that's why I say we have to speak with the we. I, I really believe a, a large part of the conflicts that we're faced with is because we we operate in division where we've categorized these gender roles right according to male and female and it's dichotomous it really separates us the the we conversation i speak i, I believe speaks to oneness oneness is oneness um there was a gentleman i met in the bahamas um, at a workshop and and he did a presentation and he was talking about how he and his wife were one and the uh, other people, there's another guy in the audience tried to make an example. And he said, well, if there's this box that's too heavy to lift, then certainly you're going to lift it and not your wife because you're, you're stronger than your wife. And his response to, to the question was, my wife and I are one. And then he says, well, well, if there's something that's going on here. And so he tried to use these multiple examples to show that, well, if it was this, then maybe the woman would do it. And again, his answer would be, we're one and well what if this wouldn't you be the one to do it we're one and what he showed me was what, what was brilliant about that example was it taught me that if if i am able to lift the box and my wife physically cannot because my wife and i are one the fact that i can lift it means she can lift it she did lift yeah. that box he lift that box because i lift that box she and i are one and if there was something that she was able to do that I was not able to do, well, I was able to do it because she did it. And when she did it, I did it because her and I are one. Um, and, and I think that type of maturation in understanding how to operate within a relationship is, is, is beautiful. And it goes a long way to resolving conflict. The we conversation is what we should really be aiming for. Mm. Well, it well, definitely is compliance with, with what we said. We're no longer uh, we're no longer twain, but one. Uh, that one flesh relationship, you know, it, it may seem to have eluded me, but I haven't totally given up. <laughs> well, Adrian, how can individuals find out more about you and follow you? I'm I'm active on social media, Instagram and Facebook. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. Adrian Carter Speaks is my handle. And my website is also adriancarterspeaks.com. And you could also get the book, that's, which is available where all books are sold. Um, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Amazon, for example. And the title of the book is Let's Get Married and Do Everything Except Make It Last. And I have a copy of the book here. I do want to point out one thing. I don't know if I shared this last time, but it, it is a double title. Right. Yes. Double title. I so love it. To, to really keep that in mind, you have an option here. You can get married and do everything except make it last. or We can get married and make it last. And it's available on Amazon, 1699. And so far, the feedback from it about it has been great. So you go out and speak at events? I do. I do. I, I speak at a number of events and I have been speaking at numerous events, um, including uh, the Empowerment Conference, uh, events with Dr. Thicklin um, up in the Palm Beach area. And I've been doing that uh, easily now for probably close to six years, five, six years. Oh, awesome. Absolutely. Dr. J, well, what do you have coming up? Well, uh, believe it or not, I have another one of these formats on, on this coming uh, Saturday night, I guess it is. It's a Saturday night or is it Sunday? I think <laughs> I have to look at the schedule, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I will be live on Facebook. We'll be addressing domestic violence and particularly dealing with domestic violence in the black community. Uh, in terms of it, we'll be dealing with some aspects of what happens when domestic violence uh, reaches leadership. You know, uh, mm. we'll be piggybacking off of the tragic story that happened in September in Orlando, unfortunately, when uh, that pastor actually went to his wife's place of employment and killed her. And um, 
and, and not without warning, you know, would I actually telling her brother that he will kill her and did exactly that. Wow. Wow. Domestic violence and the silent church. That's what I did my thesis on. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, that my and that was actually the name of my first series of uh, as for the church was called Domestic Violence and the Silent Church. And, uh, yeah. and I had a twin companion with it that talked about building bridges and restoring paths. And it was it was in a depth of those very thing that the silence of thing. And that's what's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's interesting how the church can be so silent on some thing and yet it's still so vocal on others. Right. Right. And, and, and you know, I really believe that it, I'm, I'm very thankful for my mentor and Dr. Hunt, uh, who transitioned a couple of years ago. He's my pastor's. Um, the head pastor until my father took over as the head pastor over the last couple of years. One of the best gifts I learned from him was he would open up the Bible and show how so many denominations preach about this chapter, this chapter, this, but they don't preach about this one over here. Take a look at this scripture. Look at how this scripture talks mm -hmm. about how we can be the Christ of God, mm -hmm. right? How we can, mm -hmm. how we can overcome that if, that if the Lord permits, we can become the Christ of God. Why don't people mm -hmm. talk about that? See, and, and he began to point out scriptures within the book that's often, if you will, overlooked. It's not the focal point. But by right. focusing on those scriptures, he showed us how we have the authority to not be greater than the master, but to be as, and, and how the scripture even tells you how you can walk in that particular way. Right. So, mm -hmm. so much of what the church has talked about for so long in these multiple denominations. Right. I mean, even the fact that it that it we exist in so many exactly. denominations is problematic is problematic in and of itself. And what the mm -hmm. church has done, it is split here is with the Bible because they take something in first Corinthians or second Corinthians as some of Romans and some of Ephesians, and they build a, de a denomination out of it and they mm -hmm. keep missing the point. So much of what the church ends up doing in this patriarchal um, uh, foundation is doing more to try to control women and exactly. uphold and uphold its approach to what spirituality is supposed to look like. I call it the life insurance plan. You know, uh, whoever can give you the best death policy, you know, what happens when you wow. die, you, you know, that's what, that, that's, what's going to be appealing to the individual. So whoever gives you the best death policy is the most appealing, but that's, that's man, come on. And, and, and missing, the rest of society who's going through what they're going through. I mean, it's really only recently or maybe in the last decade or so that the church has even begin to embrace therapists because before you just need to go to your pastors and the ministers and they was going to take care of all the problems. They had their own problems. They all need to go see therapists too. We all should be going, you know, so it, it, so God works through who he works through. And I think the church has to broaden its perspective and understanding how God operates in people outside the church, because there's no way God can be confronted confined to just those four walls. Yeah, yeah. I, one of the, my pet peeves right now is mental illness. I think we've closed our eyes and thinking everything is the devil when people are suffering with depression. And so if you have more depressed individuals in the church than outside of the church, and they're supposed to love the Lord and have this fire burning inside and the peace of God, but they're not at peace, and I, I think that it needs to be addressed in the church more. So it's, it's right in the, I think it's right up there with domestic violence. Well, if you look at, when I look over the course of my life over the last, especially 15 years or 20, these are things that we've raised and we've talked about. Not always, it didn't always fall on the majority years because once again, this denominationalism dominates things. But if we really be honest and go back and look at our, our history historically in the church, and particularly the church, the black church. There was a time that really social services came out of the church until people's doctrine and their yeah. belief all of a sudden kicked it out as if we did not need that. So anything that a little oil and prayer did not cure, then it wasn't it wasn't necessary. And so the problem is now. As we've talked about, and we've written about domestic violence in the silent church, we're talking about the role of the church inside of all of this. The same thing with mental health. Uh, now you hear more about the church and mental health. Uh, uh, we do some things with our first aid, mental 
health courts, health instruction with the church, but not in the capacity that we need to, because once again, the church have been vehemently opposed to stuff like therapists. What do you mean? <laughs> mind, and I have no wrestling with it, because if I start at the very basic, if I believe that we're triune being, that we are a spirit that have a soul and we live in a body, in the soulish realm is, is the mind, to see the reflected conscience and our emotion, then how is it that I only work on my spiritual side and not be concerned with my mind side? How is it that I only work on my physical side and not be concerned with that? Let this mind be in you, which was in, also in Christ Jesus, going back to what you said, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Let's go back, be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We don't want to deal with this. So people are dealing with things like not only uh, 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 depression, but anxiety, uh, eventually psychosis and all these yeah. other things. And we just want to say it's demon with something if we had, if we just would have paid attention early enough, had intervention in time enough, we could do some things here. I'm not saying... We don't believe in laying hands. Of course we do. We believe in all of that. But I'm telling you that we must understand there's some things that we deal with that it's not a matter of oops, it all gone. Something we do have to have a therapeutic plan. We need to walk through it. We need to come out of it. And let me tell you, and we ought to be honest with ourselves. When we keep seeing the same people in the same prayer lines for the same thing, then we need to know what, oops, what do, what do we have? A 36-hour deliverance? It comes back after that time. No, we need to be honest with ourselves. Perhaps there's some things that need to happen. There's so brokenness. Let's theology. Um, that's not demonized, I should say, mental health. Let's not demonize psychology. We cannot demonize it. We need to understand where they're married. And let me say this with a little time because I think it's important. We see this in this country a lot. When we see in other countries, Germany, I did a thing with Germany on domestic violence. Interesting. Their psychology and sociology student, they have a dual track with their religion. So they are married together when they take it. So when I'm there talking about the church and domestic violence, they were eating up alive. Why? Because they understood the bridge. They understood how they intersected together. Right. They didn't make them an opposition. They understood how they came together. And that's what we have to become. Wow, this is exciting. It always, when we're about to wrap up, we right. get all charged up with another topic and that's how conversation is. So I, I appreciate you, Adrian and Carter for coming. Could you give your information once again to the audience? Um, and also I invite you to follow me on YouTube and from the soul of a and also Instagram and Twitter, I'm on there too. And thank you again for having me, uh, Dr. J, Dr. Valerie. It's always a pleasure. Um, again, you all could follow me on Instagram and, and Facebook and also go to my website, which is adriancarterspeaks.com. Adrian Carter Speaks and adriancarterspeaks.com. Thank you again. And get the book. Get the book. It's get powerful. The book. I've read some of it and I, I'm telling you, if you want to understand the heart of a man, get this book. Thank you. Well, as always, we're grateful to have you. And uh, Adrian, I've said this so 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 many times to others. I said, listen here, look out for this guy. He will be one of the prolific voices of our time going forward because of the fact that you were not afraid to face what you face and understand that not to run away from it, but being able to understand it. And I love what you're doing. And uh, I continue to be a champion and a cheerleader to what you're doing because I mean, that's how we get to where we need to go. As for myself, with the time is going, you can find me uh, www.jrficklin.com. That is the website there, or destinybychoice.org. And uh, we're grateful. And go to the polls and vote. Early voting is going on. I need to tell you that no matter where you are, go to the polls and poll, uh, vote. Hey, this coming weekend, souls to the polls. Be there. Your vote is your voice. Yes, and we will have a show talking about that next Tuesday. So I thank you all for joining me on another Hot Topics from the Soul. We're here because you're here. And remember, love affects our past, our present, our future. Love is an emotion, a gift given to us from God, and it should never, ever hurt. Good night. Good night. Good night.